back up and start working our way through the digestive tract. Uh, again, we'll start kind of at the mouth. But the one thing to keep in mind as we're going through all this is what type of digestive processes are taking place where. Uh, ingestion to me is kind of an obvious one. We know where we take food in and stuff like that. But then once we get through that, we have to start talking a lot about how food is moved through uh, in terms of how we swallow, uh, how the food is moved towards the tail end of the track here. On top of that, we also need to pay attention to like what is mechanical versus chemical digestion. So mechanical digestion is mechanically breaking down food into smaller and smaller pieces. So chewing is a good example of that. Uh, we'll talk about some other processes that are also mechanical digestion, but again, knowing where that takes place. Uh, chemical digestion is when we start talking about enzymes and how the enzymes are actually breaking different chemical bonds, knowing where some of those different macromolecules that we'll talk about. So things like proteins, lipids, carbs, and nucleic acids where does chemical digestion start of each of those and what's going on there and what are some of the enzymes that are involved in this are going to be important so as we get down to some of those areas that's things to pay attention to uh, as we get to the end of this we'll talk a little bit about absorption and how different things move in uh, not surprisingly this is very uh, similar to how things get in or out of cells so there's a lot of diffusion osmosis uh, bulk transport mechanisms things along those lines and then finally how do we get rid of the stuff that we don't want? So again, ingestion is taking stuff in. This is all happening in the oral cavity in everybody. Uh, first step, like I said, in anything here. Motility, again, those different layers, those different smooth muscle layers of the digestive tract of that elementary canal are gonna be what we either voluntarily swallow, for example, or how things are gonna move around involuntarily as it gets further into the tract. But again, how we get enzymes at this material, how we get it to where it's able to be broken down. We're gonna see throughout the digestive tract, we are gonna release a lot of different uh, secretions, uh, things such as digestive enzymes, other things like bile, uh, acids in the stomach, mucus from different areas. And again, how is this stuff involved in this digestive process? What is it helping to do? Digestion, again, is that really two different things here. Mechanically breaking it down, so chewing, mixing it up, using folds and other stuff like that to break things apart. Main thing on mechanical digestion, you're physically breaking it, not chemically breaking it. Where chemical digestion, using enzymes to break chemical bonds, and again, knowing which types of chemical digestion start happening where. So where do we start breaking down carbohydrates? Where do we start breaking down proteins? Where do we break down fats? Where do we break down nucleic acids? Again, we're doing all this so we can absorb these nutrients. So to get these things into the bloodstream or the lymph, which sooner or later gets it back into the bloodstream. And again, this is all about making this stuff available to our cells in order to the cells have their building blocks. Because the only way for us to really get the building blocks of how our cells are going to put proteins together, put carbs together, is we need the raw materials for that. And finally, there's going to be things that are not digestible or things that are not absorbed. How do we get rid of those? That's that idea of elimination or excretion. Again, these upper GI tract organs are gonna be where we're starting out here. So we're gonna start out with the oral cavity and the salivary glands, talking a little bit about what goes on there. We know with the mouth that there's mechanical digestion taking place with the teeth. We're gonna see that there is some uh, chemical digestion that also starts taking place of starches. Uh, we'll see, and I'll show this again in a little bit. Sal saliva has uh, what's called salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that starts clipping starches, which are large carbohydrates, into smaller, simpler sugars. Uh, and again, mixes with this material. We swallow that, moves through the throat. Uh, a little bit of mucus being secreted to help with the swallowing, but outside of that, not much happens to it there. We're gonna work our way down from there through the esophagus, mainly just mucus secretions, not anything else going on there, until we get to the stomach, where you're gonna have a lot of mixing a number, a couple, like an enzyme or two that gets released in here along with a lot of acid. We mix all the stuff into something we call chyme. And that's really what we'll work through on the upper part here. So when we start talking about the ingestion, it's all happening at the mouth. And really a lot of our structures here are all about that mechanical digestion or the ability to chew things up or masticate. 
So mastication is using your teeth, these really hard structures to break down mechanically what we ingest. Uh, what we're doing on this one, the reason we break stuff down, the reason we chew stuff up is it increases the surface area. And more surface area means more ability of digestive enzymes to break this down. If you swallow something whole, and if you think about animals that do swallow stuff whole, like constrictor snakes and things like that, a lot of times it takes them quite a long time to digest that. And again, when you don't break it up, those enzymes don't, can only work from the outside in, and therefore the digestive process will take quite a bit longer. Uh, but when you are chewing something, you are going to salivate. And again, this is using a little bit of voluntary control of those lips and tongue and cheek and things like that to chew along with uh, some of our autonomics in terms of the medulla and the pons releasing some of those salivary secretions to help break this down in some cases chemically as well as helping to moisten that food and help it form into a bolus so it's something we were able to swallow. Uh, if you haven't seen a mouth, you need to look in the mirror. This is the mouth you can see here. The oral cavity, the hard palate, the soft palate, the tongue, the different types of teeth. Again, we're not going to get really super crazy into teeth and the different structures on these ones, but you need to have a basic understanding of the oral cavity structure. So what is the soft palate? What is the tongue? What are the lips? Which isn't tough for most people. If you could label this figure, you have all you need for knowing what's going on with the digestive tract in terms of anatomy of this. So you can see the hard palate and the soft palate, the tongue, and we've already talked about the different parts of the pharynx. With digestion, generally the nasal pharynx shouldn't be involved, but the food is gonna pass through these other regions. Again, the oral cavity is lined by that mucous membrane, which we know is non-keratinized version of stratified squamous epithelium. Obviously a little bit on the surface of the lips, uh, there is, could be some keratinized epithelium on the surface there, but almost everything we're talking about here is that non-keratinized stratified squamous, again, covered with mucus that we're secreting. The teeth, which we together, all together we call dentition, these are what are going to help us chew stuff down, break it down into smaller parts. There's a number of different parts to that tooth held in place by a ligament, this connective tissue that holds that into that gonfosis type of joint. Uh, again, I'm not super concerned about you knowing all the parts of a tooth, like what is dentin versus the rest of this here. Enamel is kind of interesting in that it is a calcium phosphate crystal. crystal. It is the hardest structure we'll see in the body, actually harder than bone even. And the inner part of the tooth is living it does have this connective tissue, this pulp, along with a nerve that goes into that tooth, which is part of the reason if you are having cavities or other stuff like that, you can have really bad toothaches. Uh, again, the canal, continuous with that pulp cavity, and again, help to be held in place by that root. It is kind of interesting, and I always like to show this real quickly, but you have baby teeth, which we call deciduous teeth. If you think about deciduous trees, they lose their leaves. We lose our deciduous teeth. Uh, we do get in permanent teeth on most people that will be 32 different teeth of slightly different dentitions. We are omnivores, so we do have some canines and incisors along with more of those grain eating type of teeth of the molars, where if you look at some other animals, you will not see as much different in the dentition. Uh, again, you can see the parts of the tooth here. Again, not expecting you to label this. I would not give this as a lab type of thing at all. We're gonna see we have the incisors, which are on the front of the teeth, the canines just outside of that, premolars back to the molars. Again, all these teeth are gonna be doing slightly different things, which is part of the reason we're able to have the type of diet that we do, which is a mix of different uh, types of foods. We are not all meat, we are not all vegetable or green. We are a mixture of all those things. Uh, the gums are gingiva, are helping to hold this in place. Again, some regular connective tissue with stratified squamous over the top of it that helps hold and secure these teeth. And again, you can see some of the different types of the teeth here. Again, I'm not going to show you a picture of a mouth and say what's an incisor, what's a bicuspid, what's a canine or anything else like that. This one's always just kind of wicked though because this is showing you somebody who hasn't got in their 
adult teeth yet. So you can see these would be deciduous or primary teeth down here. The tooth bud is already actually up in the skull and will migrate down, which again, when you see it like this, is kind of a really kind of freaky image when you see it within this skull where some of the skull has been cut away. The other thing to talk about with the oral cavity is the saliva. It helps to moisten the food, uh, helps you form it into a bolus. If you've ever ate some really, really dry foods and you feel like you have to sit there and chew on it for a while and it's like you can't swallow it very well, this is because you need enough saliva to help that food stick to itself and not to your oral cavity. So saliva helps moisten that food, helps form it into a bolus. It is going to act as a solvent for a lot of the chemicals that are in it. Helps to buffer any acids that are in this one. Uh, slightly alkaline pH. Uh, pretty neutral though in terms of saliva. And we're going to see there's actually three pair of glands that are above this. The parotid glands are out here. Some mandibular run along here. And the sublingual are underneath the tongue. And you can see all these right here. So you can see the parotid is in front of the cheeks right here. If you've ever thought about eating a lemon and your cheeks kind of squeeze in, that's actually the smooth muscle in your parotid glands kind of anticipating that. So parotid gland, like I said, is the largest of these ones. It's about 30% of the saliva. You have a nice duct that takes it to the mouth. Some mandibular glands make the vast majority of the saliva. So they are underneath the oral cavity. Uh, like it says, they're medial to the mandible body, so just inside the bone. And again, open from a duct in the floor of the mouth, from the gland to that. The sublingual ones are underneath the tongue and have a couple of tiny little ducts that uh, release the saliva. If you've accidentally ever shot saliva out of your mouth, it was probably from a sublingual salivary gland. And when we're looking at saliva, what is it? It's mainly water. Uh, so, like I said, they're 97, 99% water with a few different electrolytes mixed in. We do have one key enzyme that's in here that will start the chemical digestion of uh, starches. So, salivary amylase will take starches and break them down into more simple sugars. Uh, outside of that, we have some antibodies of the IgA type that are in there and some antimicrobial substances, things like lysozyme, which would help destroy bacteria. On any particular day, you make about a liter to a liter and a half of saliva, mostly while you're eating. Uh, but again, kind of disturbing to think about a almost half full to three quarters full, two liter jug of saliva is what you produce in a day. So kind of disturbing in that sense. Uh, saliva is, at least the release of it is somewhat through the autonomic nervous system. We do not have conscious control over this. If you've ever taken sight, you know that you can do a conditioned response. They, when they talk about Pavlov's dog and ringing a bell to get the dog to salivate, you could do that with a human if you really wanted to. Kind of a weird experiment to go and do, but it's really that presence of food or the smell of food, a lot of times is going to trigger these receptors to fire off and these chemoreceptors or pressure receptors are going to send messages to the pons, to the glossal and pharyngeal nerves. They integrate with that salivary center in the brainstem and are going to send motor commands to those contractile cells of those salivary glands to kind of squeeze and release that saliva. So what we'll pick up with next time is we'll start talking about the different throat regions, swallowing and making our way down to the stomach. Until next time.